Hello, I'm Novelette Witt with Morgan Real Estate. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention defines aging in place as the ability to live in one's own home and community comfortably, independently, regardless of age, income, or ability level. According to the U.S. Census, in 2020, the population aged 65 and over is projected to be 83.7 million. This projected growth of older populations in the U.S. will present challenges to policymakers and programs such as Social Security and Medicare. It will also affect families, businesses, and healthcare providers. Joining us today to address some of these issues is Dr. Fernando Torres Gill, who is a professor of social welfare and public policy at UCLA. He's also director of UCLA Center for Policy Research on Aging and an adjunct professor of gerontology at USC. He also serves as acting dean and associate dean at the UCLA School of Public Affairs, and most recently, chair of the social welfare department. He has written six books and over 100 publications, including The New Aging Politics and Change in America and Aging, Health, and Longevity in the Mexican Origin Population. His most recent book with Jay Angel examines the politics of a majority minority nation, aging, diversity, and immigration. It is truly an honor to welcome Professor Torres Gill. Hello, Professor. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. It's great to be with you, Novelette, and uh, my uh, greetings to the entire South Bay community. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you. Now, tell me, um, I guess the first question is, how, how does this aging in place affect California residents? Aging in place, if we give it a definition, is about the freedom, the opportunity, the independence to choose how you want to live as you grow older. Okay. Most individuals would prefer to grow older in the home they've known since maybe middle age or the home where they raised their children and to live in the communities where they've developed the support system. So aging in place is really about having the choice to stay where you're at as you grow older. But not everyone will choose to or be able to age in place. But that seems to be what most individuals want. Right, right, of course. So then, if someone wants to stay in their home, what are some of the obstacles that they have to overcome in order to make that happen? Mm -hmm. Aging in place, however, has its complexity. Mm -hmm. And even though it seems to be preferred by most individuals, most don't fully understand what that means. And that is one contribution I hope to make with my professional and scholarly and research, is to bring out the complexity so that individuals and families are better informed. Aging in place, first and foremost, is about can you live in your home, in your neighborhood, as you grow older and begin to experience the inevitable physical, emotional, chronic conditions that face most persons as they grow older? Mm -hmm. Or more simply, what happens when you no longer can walk well? Mm -hmm. You cannot drive yourself. You cannot negotiate the steps in your home. You cannot get in and out of your shower safely. And what happens when you want to age in place in your home, but you no longer have family members or children around to assist you? And that is what we like to bring out to individuals to think ahead, be proactive, and recognize that aging in place is a more complex challenge, and one has to prepare for it at least five, even ten years mm -hmm. beforehand. And there's a number of elements that go into that, and I'm happy to list them. Yes, please, enlighten us. I would suggest that there's probably four areas mm -hmm. in this aging in place continuum. The first is what we'll call simply smart homes. Mm -hmm. Have you renovated your home, or bought a home, or prepared your home so that regardless of whether you cannot walk well, or you need a walker, or a wheelchair, mm -hmm. or you're visually and hearing impaired, your home is set up mm -hmm. so that you can still stay safely. Usually that means having a bedroom, 
on the first floor. Usually it means completely redoing your bathroom so it has the grab bars and it has slip resistant services. It means such things as widening the doorway so that you can use a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It means having an additional room if you need a companion or a caregiver to spend the night. It means using the latest technology which can adjust the lighting, which can help you to hear things better, mm -hmm. help you to know what's around your surroundings. So there's a lot to do to prepare your home to be smart mm -hmm. in enabling you to age in place regardless of the condition. That's the first. The second thing, let's just call it the financial aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Can you afford to stay in your home? We find that even in affluent neighborhoods, as people live into their 80s and 90s, they begin to face what we call house rich and cash poor. That is, they have spent down their monies. Inflation has eroded their pensions and their savings. Or maybe a medical emergency has taken a large chunk of their financial resources. But yet the home, especially in the South Bay, and, and in most parts of California, has tremendous equity. So the issue becomes, can you afford to stay in your home? And if you don't have financial resources, should you consider such things as a reverse annuity mortgage or tapping into the equity? That raises other issues. Mm -hmm. Can you find a reverse annuity mortgage that makes sense? Will your children not be happy with using your equity? If you want to leave it for your children or grandchildren, there are many financial aspects to how do I stay in my home as my financial resources decline, especially in a place like California. The third we'll call the caregiving and long-term care issues. Most individuals when they hit their 80s and 90s will need assistance mm -hmm. with the activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living, somebody to shop for them, somebody to handle their bills, someone to assist them to dress possibly, bathe, cook, transferring, toileting. Most individuals in your 80s and 90s will need somebody around to assist you. Is that home set up to have a caregiver, a companion? Is the individual comfortable with strangers coming into their home that will assist them with their caregiving needs? And then the last fourth area is Perhaps an institutional arrangement makes more sense than aging in place in your own home. And it's that last issue that causes most individuals a sense of insecurity and even denial. And again, I'm happy to address that fourth one in greater detail. Yes, please, carry on. This fourth aspect about aging in place, which follows the issue of, you know, is your home set up smartly? Uh, do you have the financial resources? Have you prepared for caregiving home care? The fourth is, maybe the home is not the best place to age in place. Mm -hmm. Maybe a more semi-formal or even institutional arrangement. And here we're talking about assisted living, board and care facilities continuing care retirement community, even the dreaded quote-unquote nursing home. Mm -hmm. Those different aspects of what we'll call institutional arrangements can in fact be a better option at some point when living at home becomes too complicated, too expensive, or there is insufficient support system to stay in the home safely and to afford to stay in the home. And here, one should plan well in advance to check out in your neighborhood, what are the supportive services if I cannot stay in my home? And there are some advantages to what we'll call formal or supportive services or institutional services. First of all, one of the great issues facing many adults as they grow older in their home, isolation and depression. As they grow older, their children move out, or they don't have children, or the children aren't available. Living alone in your home can lead to isolation, insufficient socialization, depression, 
and in the most extreme cases, suicide. So being stuck in your home, especially since most of us live in suburban areas like the South Bay, you're no longer able to drive, you may not be able to get on a bus, you may not want to use Lyft or Uber, and so therefore looking for a place that can provide you supportive services, formal caregiving, and most places today, including nursing homes, are actually not the image we had of 30, 40 years ago, that they're a warehouse. Continuing care retirement communities, and there are some beautiful CCRCs in the South Bay, can, for the same price of staying at home with all these other services, be as affordable or be no more than if you had to hire people to come to your home. So I would suggest that in looking at the options that give you independence, freedom, choices, to not just assume that you'll stay in your home, but that there may be other alternative arrangements, board and care facilities, assisted living, continuing care retirement communities, senior 50 and older senior resorts, and even nursing homes or long-term care facilities can in fact be a good choice. But the important thing is to get beyond the sense of fear, insecurity, and denial. The reality is that if we're lucky, we will all live a good long life, well into our 80s and 90s. And the reality is that many of us will not be able to stay in our homes. And therefore, it's in your 40s, 50s, and 60s that you begin to look at all the various options in your community. And I always like to say that one aspect of your social support system that in reality will be least available and least dependable for you, your children. Do not depend on your kids. Assuming you have kids, assuming you get along with your kids, assuming they're not wrapped up in their own lives, assuming they don't live geographically far from you, you should assume that you'll grow older without your children available. Your children and grandchildren are the icing on the cake. Plan to set your own independence in terms of these alternative living arrangements, and the children can step in, and the grandchildren, to provide the emotional support, to come visit, to bring the grandkids. But we know with the aging of the baby boomers, those of us born between 1946 and 1964, we will have the largest number of senior citizens that are growing old without spouses, without children, either divorced, widowed, or never married. So there's a real trend for individuals to grow older and living on their own. All the more reason to begin to look at alternative living arrangements, creating formal support systems, neighbors, friends, partners, other, people, ki other people's children. So aging is complex, it's dynamic, but as they say, uh, the uh, it's a better choice than the alternative, living longer. Lovely, thank you so much, I appreciate that. But one more question before you go. Um, how would you say, uh, for those who are disenfranchised, I know you mentioned briefly oh, the uh, briefly. financial bit, but what, how, how do they survive <coughs> this part yep. of their life? And uh, in the aging of our society, aging in California, aging in your local neighborhoods, we are, be we are now witnessing the same kind of social and economic disparities among the older population that we have in the general population. Simply put, the lucky few of us will grow older with financial resources, with pension retirement plans, with our homes paid off, and with retiree health care coverage. We are the fortunate ones. Many others, however, will be more marginal. They may have been middle income, middle class throughout their adult lives, insufficient retirement, no pensions, they have mortgages on their homes, they face bankruptcies, a medical emergency, or their children are in financial troubles. And so many more middle class families are not that far from falling into poverty. And then we have those that are low income and poor. Certainly 
persons of color, women, the disabled. So we're going to have tremendous variation in the older population. Those who are doing well, those who thought they were doing okay throughout much of their lives, and as they get older, suddenly finding themselves at financial risk of falling into poverty. And then those who are already poor. So I'd like to add for all of us, wherever you fall on that income financial spectrum, the bottom line is we must ensure a social safety net for all of us. Whether we need it, or we think we don't need it, or we're dependent. And what is that social safety net? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, the Older Americans Act, Supplemental Security Income, Social Security, Disability Income. These are the social safety nets that have kept older persons from experiencing what they faced in the 1930s. Where if they were poor or did not have family or social supports, they were left on their own to live on the streets, to beg on the streets. Clearly we don't want that in this century. But that social safety net must be preserved. And for those of us that might be conservative or Republican, or live in a beautiful place like the Palos Verdes Peninsula, let me just say that all of us, regardless of our political affiliation, regardless of our ideological predisposition, must ensure that social safety net is maintained. Because it's about those of us who, through no fault of our own, find ourselves in old age, impoverished, alone, and at risk. So it's there for all of us regardless of how we might live out our lives.